I'm Dave Ferguson. I'm the Associate Dean here at CAP. And uh, we're delighted to, to launch our guest lecture series. Uh, if you're new to the college, we, uh, we have these guest lectures in this same time slot about every other week throughout the year. So there's a poster up that lists the future uh, speakers for fall, and we'll have one for spring up soon. But um, we're really happy to see everybody here, and we hope you take advantage of these folks that we're bringing in from all over the world to give you different perspectives. We also are offering CEUs tonight, so uh, Tracy Hendricks and over by the door is, uh, will be willing to sign you up, and she'll also come up to the balcony as well, so look for her. And we also have an exhibit that parallels this talk today, that Smith Group, JJR, the firm that uh, Troy Thompson represents, uh, has put together with the help of Malcolm Carnes, who uh, has been our exhibit coordinator, and I just walked through that exhibit, and it's really uh, a nice representation of work. Some of it is uh, Troy's personal-led uh, projects, but it's also a nice cross-section of work that their 11 offices uh, have produced. So it's my pleasure to introduce our guest lecturer for our first one for this year. Uh, it also gives us a chance to introduce Troy Thompson, Smith Group, JJR, as a launch of our recently awarded Emmons Distinguished Professorship, which is a competition. We, we, uh, all the colleges submit competitive proposals each year for funding for a distinguished professorship. And uh, CAP was awarded that, uh, the Emmons uh, Professorship last week. And we are designating uh, Smith Group JJR as a firm in residence under that distinguished uh, professorship. It's the first time that's been done in, in Ball State's history, as far as we know. And we're really uh, looking forward to maximizing the resources of that group uh, as we work together this year. Uh, in addition to this talk, as part of that distinguished professorship, what you can look forward to from Smith Group is that they will be back to launch the beginning of our spring lecture series in January. We're going to be attempting to do a, an interdisciplinary studio together with uh, one of their offices. We're going to be trying to do a set a research agenda for collaborative research, and we're still open to ideas. So uh, if you have some thoughts about how we might engage, uh, please uh, funnel them towards the dean's office or the department chairs, and we'll be happy to talk about it. Troy serves as managing partner for Smith Group JJR. He's part of a three-person leadership team at the firm. They have 11 offices worldwide. He focuses on initiatives in talent development, research, knowledge management, and innovation planning and design tools and processes. Basically, he's the guy in charge of innovation, which is really fortunate for us because the topic he's talking about today is going to be very important to CAP's future over the next year, year and a half, as we look at the dynamics of integrating construction management and interior design into the other disciplines that are here and trying to anticipate what's happening out there in the, uh, in the uh, private sector and public sector as technology overtakes us all and causes us to adapt. Troy has more than 20 years of experience, mostly in historic preservation, architecture, cultural and archaeological projects around the world. He served um, as art lead architect with the archaeological exploration of Sardis, Turkey from 1988 to 2011. He's a specialist in historic preservation, has published and uh, lectured extensively. His uh, recent projects include the U.S. National Park Service's w White House Visitor Center, <coughs> the Smithsonian Castle, and Harvard University's Archaeological Exploration of Sardis. He was principal and director of historic preservation for HNTB Architecture uh, from 2001 to 2004. He was a studio leader at Schmidt Associates Architects from 98 to 2001 and a founding partner at Halstead, Thompson, and Kennedy Architects. He also worked as a preservation architect at the Institute of Monument Restoration. Prior to all of that, Troy sat where you're sitting uh, because he is an alum uh, of CAP. I first met Troy when he traveled with me as a student when he was a student and I was faculty lead on our European tour, PolyArc. Troy uh, earned a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Design, Bachelor of Science in Philosophy, and a Bachelor of Architecture, all at the same time, from Ball State. And then he went on to receive a Master of Arts in American History from George Mason. 
His topic tonight is launching a year-long conversation, as I mentioned, for this college, uh, as, as we hope to, to uh, continue to think about what's next in our fields of planning, architecture, landscape architecture, interior design, and construction management, and how we can better integrate and innovate in a rapidly changing world. After Troy's remarks, uh, we're pleased that we'll be able to introduce a panel that will respond to his comments. The title of Troy's talk is We're Not Obsolete Yet, Design in a Post-Professional World of Design Build and Artificial Intelligence. Please help me welcome Troy Thompson. Well, since you probably can tell how old I am, I'm going to go ahead and say it, but standing up here is like looking at a live Facebook. All these people are popping up that you know, I haven't seen in a while. So it's great to be back here, especially to mark uh, the integration of construction and interior design with the, with the college. But I think a lot of what we're going to talk about are some ideas that can be part of this framework and some of the things we think about um, over the course of the year. But there are things that you guys are going to be struggling with uh, for the rest of your career. So there's going to be a generational perspective. You're going to see that a lot of this is coming from my experience, um, but I'm the generation right now that's sort of defining what happens in the profession. So uh, I'm here uh, not to predict the future or tell you what the future is going to be, but rather throw out some ideas of some things I think we all need to be uh, worrying about, thinking about, and opportunities we can take advantage of. So there's going to be a little bit of darkness here at the beginning, but I think you'll see that in the end there's a lot of light around the idea of design and what you're going to be taught to do uh, in this building. So we're not obsolete yet, but there are a lot of forces who uh, seem to have an interest in making us obsolete. So when I was in school, and most of us, we were kind of taught this is who we were going to be. This could be Frank Lloyd Wright, it could be Daniel Leaves, it could be any number of people, but we were going to be literally at that time the white visionary creative genius male, right? We're the authors, we're the great creators, uh, it's all embodied in us, we're going to set the next style, all of those things. By the time you get out and work for two or three years, this is who most of us became. We were professionals, we're architects, engineers, planners, landscape architects, working in firms of all sizes, doing projects with all kinds of clients, uh, just sort of going on our way. But that's a long way from uh, what Frank Lloyd Wright and some of the star architects that we've grown up, grown up with. Uh, so my point today is the future no longer favors either one of those models. Um, I think there are models that are favored but it, we got to get over some of the baggage that goes with both of those images. Um, the big force that is, is affecting all work in the world is this idea of automation. We like to think that because we're professionals or designers, it's not affecting us. Um, it is affecting us. But the bigger thing is when people talk about automation, they talk about it in very kind of apocalyptic terms. Um, you know, 50% of all jobs are going to be gone in, in 20 years. Um, that's not probably accurate. So. Um, what I wanted to do is the history of technology is about innovation, new changes in how we do things, uh, automation, all of those things. But when we do go through a technological revolution, we create new jobs that didn't exist before it. So it's not a zero-sum game. If technology is wiping out five million jobs in five years, some of those are going to be coming back. So that's important to remember. It's, it's, it's thinking about doing your work differently. The other, I love the chart on the right. I know it's difficult to read. but. Uh, in a poll, 65% of the people said that uh, work that's being done by humans now will be automated in 50 years. Those same people, 80% uh, of them said it won't happen to their job, though. <laughs> so this gets back to that idea of us thinking we know who we are as designers. Um, it is happening to us. Uh, we're not like the public, and, and we shouldn't think it's everybody but us. It is going to be us. Um, so what I would like to do is think about it not in terms of jobs, but think about it in terms of work and what we do. Uh, McKinsey did a study, and instead of focusing on jobs, they look at the percentage of tasks and the types of things that people do and found that roughly 60% of work um, can be replaced and automated once voice recognition is fully, fully working better than it is now. So think about that. That number matches the amount of time that most uh, firms spend doing construction documents and construction contract administration. Those are the two areas that are being affected by a lot of these trends. So that number is important if you think about it just in terms of work. Um, I mentioned we have been uh, being automated. It started with AutoCAD. AutoCAD was basically just doing what we've been doing with a computer instead of a, a T-square. Then we went into SketchUp. And as these technologies came along, 
We didn't rethink sort of what we were doing or why we were doing it or how we were doing it. More importantly, we didn't rethink what our relationship was with contractors and with clients or the relationship between design and fabrication and construction. So once you get to Revit and Dynamo and some of these other softwares that you all probably know much better than I do, uh, that those force a different type of collaboration, different type of interaction, and more of an interdisciplinary approach, which is why um, bringing in more disciplines in the school is so important. And ultimately, uh, Autodesk is already done with Revit. Uh, they moved on to Quantum, which is a, a platform that actually starts to build itself on artificial intelligence. So if you're looking at the structural beams and columns in a building, it can go into anybody's software on the team, a fabricator, a contractor, a designer, pull the information it needs to understand what that structure work is, and then help, help direct the fabrication of it. So the software has gone beyond automation. It's now starting to actually be more active in, in how we do our work. Uh, contractors are getting it just as, as severely as we are. Um, if you think about all of the things that are happening in construction the, in terms of automations, uh, drones, robots, uh, bricklayers, you know, we've got automated bricklayers now, prefabrication, printing bridges, these are all technologies that are happening today. They're affecting the way contractors do their work and they're affecting their business model as well because all of a sudden they're used to making a lot of money on labor. All of a sudden they don't need the same skill set that they needed, they needed before. On the, the bricklayer, all they need is a mason to tool the joints and make sure the machine's still working <laughs> instead of having four, five, six masons. So their work's being impacted the same way we are, which is one of the reasons some of the, this next trend, they're starting to look at us. Um, as a profession, we've let a lot of other forces like insurance and attorneys sort of define what kind of risk and liability we want to take on. We wanted to be the grand visionary, we want to be the big designer, but we don't want to be accountable for things like the cost and the schedule and you know, means and methods, how things get built. So we've, we've sort of let uh, other forces start to shape our role and redefine how we relate to clients. So I know many of you probably don't know about design build and uh, construction management yet, but the point of this is back in the 70s, a number of forces started to come into play, I think largely because as professionals, we had sort of let go of some of the control and some of the leadership on some of the aspects of how we, how we would design and build buildings. So contractors became construction managers. So they went and told the owners, we can, we can help you with your schedule, we can control your budget, we can help manage those crazy architects and engineers. Then that became program managers, so another sort of hybrid. And ultimately now what's happening is this design build model where the diagram on the right at the top shows the way we'd worked for about 100 years, for a century. We had a contract with the owner, the contractor had a contract with the owner, and then the owner had to kind of integrate between the two of us. It was meant to be a check and balance, but it quickly became antagonistic uh, here in the last few years. Under the design build model, the owner has one contract, and typically, because of, again, liability um, and the, the bonding and business reasons, we work for the contractor. So the dark view of this, as I've been told by big contractors, we're all going to be working for them. And I don't think that's where we want to be going. They're also uh, really setting the pace on a lot of innovation that I think design firms aren't. Um, we'll, we'll talk in a minute, one of our great value points is this idea of data and knowledge. Um, design build contractors in particular are going upstream and downstream much quicker than we are. They take our Revit models and immediately build a new Revit model and then turn around and tell the client, my Revit model is better for you in terms of operating your facility. Uh, so I'll sell you this Revit model. <laughs> They're also starting to do their own uh, post-occupancy evaluations, which is a way of, after the building's been open for a year, go in and say, did the building meet our goals that we identified in design? Is it performing the way we want it to? Is it using the right amount of energy? That's creating this data stream. We're not doing that at the same pace they are. Finally, they're, they're using virtual reality, augmented reality much more aggressively than we are. They're actually using it for laborers in the field to build, but they're also using it to show owners progress. They're hiring our architects and engineers on a regular basis. One big design build firm has 85, 90 architects and engineers in India doing data analysts, uh, building Revit models, uh, visualizations, 
you name it. And finally, they're, they're going to control the new version of construction, which is 3D printing, different types of additive manufacturing. Um, the next big force is artificial intelligence. Um, this is one that's just starting to get in our realm. Um, it's, it's kind of automation for professionals, if you will. Um, but I think we really need to think about what this means because this does help us reposition our value chain. And, and the big shift that's happened with artificial intelligence recently is it's now to the point where it can teach itself. Um, it's not becoming sentient, but, but it can teach itself. So back in the spring, I opened up the Washington Post one morning, Sunday morning, in the little business section with all the little paragraphs of you know, business news. IBM bought a 65 person accounting firm in Washington, DC. And then it said, we bought this firm to teach Watson how to do accounting. So here they're, they're building Watson in all these industries to take on a lot of the professional activities uh, that people are already doing. Then that night on 60 Minutes, they had a session on Watson and medicine. And they showed how Watson diagnoses cancer more effectively than doctors and how Watson can recommend treatments that are 18 to 24 months ahead of what a doctor could do just simply by the volume of information that Watson consumes. So if you think about that, we're doing everything in software. We've got Revit models, uh, Rhino models. Those models can be aggregated and there's no reason I think Autodesk couldn't tell us whether or not our buildings need code compliance. So when you start to go down that slippery slope, well, if somebody else can protect the public, then why do we need a professional stamp? So you can see some of these things can start to go to places that we probably don't want them to and aren't in our best interest. The last topic that's a, an issue to deal with is this idea of the end of the professions. Um, this is not a new idea. I know I'm in Indiana and I know Trump's up here, so uh, my wife knows I'm showing it too. <laughs> but there's been a long discussion in America going all the way back to the 60s about the, the nature of American culture um, starting in the colonial period and, and what is our attitude about intellectuals, uh, specialists, professionals, um, experts, and part of that is wrapped up in this idea of authority. Um, so I think there's a, there's a real focus these last few years on what's happening in terms of the, the, the general public not seeing the value and buying into the old idea of what it means to be a professional and what we're contributing to society and even whether or not we should be left alone to self-regulate. Um, there is a relationship in all of this between this whole debate about fake news, what's a fact, what's true, is if we don't have some of these things, then our role as creators of knowledge and protectors of the public realm really comes into question. Um, a lot of that discussion also centers around the democratization of knowledge, crowdsourcing, cloud computing, all out of scale uh, to knowledge that lets us make decisions we couldn't make on our own. Um, ed edX, which is a consortium of Harvard, Stanford, a number of big universities providing massive online uh, courses. They found when, when Harvard set theirs up, they went out and hired the best professors in, in, in certain knowledge areas to create these outstanding curricula for courses and they collected students from all over the world and they found over time when they were modeling some of the early classes that if you have a diverse enough group of students asking the same question working together they got to the same place that the professor wanted them to start with so this again this whole idea of a singular point of knowledge and expertise is really a question and you know now you don't even go to the doctor you go to WebMD or you go to the CBS pharmacy and, and see a nurse practitioner Competition uh, is getting in our business uh, like you wouldn't believe. The JLL, DPR, and Ralph Applebaum, an exhibition designer, these are all clients, they're partners. They're all now starting to get in and provide professional services just like we do. Uh, some other companies you've probably never heard of, these are like business management companies, Booz Allen, McKinsey. They're now collecting huge amounts of data and providing planning and organizational development. Uh, around facilities at a scale that no architecture firm uh, would ever sort of dream of approaching. And uh, Airbnb and WeWork are now doing urban design and architectural design. Airbnb has realized that they're selling an experience.
So they're now moving into projects where they're actually doing the urban design and then starting to actually design some of the product. Same with WeWork. WeWork used to be a big client of ours, then they stole two or three of our best parametric designers, and now we're competing with them. It is happening to architecture. Uh, there are a lot of websites like this that are largely residential. Great design, this is, this is not uh, affordable housing. These are still half a million dollar houses by the time they're done. But there are websites popping up all over the place like that. And then this is one I saw recently, uh, Architect on Demand. And so I dug into their website, and here's the attitude. Access professional advice if and when it's necessary. So it goes back to this idea again about whether or not we're even needed or when we're needed or how much we're needed. Um, and you know, this is us. These are our people uh, going down this path. So did I completely depress everybody? <laughs> <laughs> no, you guys are okay. Well, the future is design. Uh, there's no doubt about it that the future is design, and design is what we're taught to do uh, in this building. And it's only going to be better, I think, now that we have more disciplines and more allies in here, and that now that we're actually in school connecting design and construction and the whole process of creating and making. Um, so I think Ball State is actually in a place where we can take a leadership position in this discussion, and that's part of why this is such an interesting idea this year of, of being here to help that happen. So if we go back to technology replacing jobs, um, the circle highlights the management, um, the expertise, and the sort of judgment and interaction piece of work that's least susceptible to automation and least susceptible to AI. Those are all around creativity. So the World Economic Forum even calls out architecture and engineering as a handful of the disciplines that probably have the longest life, uh, given what's going on with technology and, uh, and uh, artificial intelligence. And then back to the McKinsey work that doesn't look at it in terms of jobs, looks at it again in terms of tasks and type of work. They estimate that a third of all work activity, depending on what you're doing for the most part, is around creativity and sensing emotions. Um, that corresponds to schematic design and design development, which um, w when some of you get out and start doing your internship, that's about 35% of a normal fee. So I think, again, if you think about some of this information in a slightly different way, it does give you an idea of where to be looking in terms of where our future is and what kind of value we're bringing to this, this whole enterprise. So I think the other big opportunity is this idea of integrated design. Um, you, you may or may not have heard a lot about what the whole idea of integrated design is. I think the shift that we've started to see over the last few years is it's no longer a, a sort of full service attitude, where in the past a number of firms would have architecture and landscape architecture and planning and urban design and uh, engineering and they called it full service. Integrated design is not full service. Integrated design is a philosophy. You don't have to be in the same firm to practice integrated design, which is really about getting as many different inputs and perspectives around a problem as early as possible uh, to get the better outcome sooner. Um, so the fact that Foster and Partners six years ago bought an engineering firm, Big just bought one and made this big deal that they had reinvented uh, integrated design, even though a lot of people have been doing it, um, does show that it's a shift from just a simple full service firm to an actual attitude about how we do design and how many disciplines and participants should be part of that. So how many people know what this is? Raise your hands. Anybody over 45 raise their hand? <laughs> oh. <laughs> this, is a, this is a design sketch in Rhino. Um, we're looking at parametric design. You can set the parameters. You can set the rules for how this is going to look at the form, how it's going to interpret the form. It can even get to the point of actually generating the forms if you want to go that way. But that interface led to the analyses of this, which was, was taking this, this technology that is parametric design. It does start to learn. Um, it, it gives you ability to look at things at a level we never could as designers, um, especially in terms of performance, which is a big aspect of integrated design. So you can see through a number of models, it sort of tells us which one maximizes daylight, which one minimizes glare, 
but at a much more refined level than we ever could have done without this kind of technology. So this technology and data um, should be a major input into how we design. And you know, this is going to be the finished building. None of this is meant to say that in the end we're not about doing beautiful places and you know, great architecture, great landscape architecture, and great design. That's still what we do, but we've got to rethink uh, the idea that that's all we do. It, it really is about doing a smarter, more representative type of design process that still leads to great architecture. In this case, the architects are more excited about what the engineers did with the systems than they are about the architecture. This is the DC Water uh, headquarters, not the type of client that typically would do great architecture. It's design build, it was a competition. Um, we won it, but part of why we won it was our engineers came up with a system. This is built over one of their sewage pumping stations. So they're actually gonna heat the building with the sewage that's running underneath the building. So you know the architects are out there telling these great stories about how this building is completely functioning in, a, in another, uh, another realm from, from what we're used to in the past. But the fact that the architects tell that story is, is a big cultural shift. I think the, the next step for this integrated design, and I think the next step for education, and I know Dave and I have talked a lot about this, we're really exploring this idea in the firm about moving to a design thinking model, which is the model that was developed by IDEO and the Stanford Business School. Our clients know about design thinking, we don't really know about design thinking the way we were taught. We tend to be taught in the, the ideate circle, kind of right in the middle of it, which is somebody gives you a building program, you turn around, you look at options, you create an idea. We do drawings to communicate that idea, and then the contractor and the owner go off and build it. Sometimes we start to get up in the orange. I think we'll hear about that maybe from our panel. Now with technology and modeling, we can start to get into the blue, into the prototyping and the modeling. But I think the other key piece with this is the idea of empathy, which has to do again with uh, diverse thinking, uh, respect for multiple perspectives, the whole idea of crowdsourcing and sort of breaking down that old idea of sort of a single visionary author. So uh, as I mentioned, IDEO, these are the people that work in their process. You know, teachers, toy makers, filmmakers, that those are the folks who help them solve problems. And they no longer focus just on product and problems or physical uh, solutions. They now design entire healthcare systems, <laughs> not just you know, the tools that they use. And finally, uh, within the spirit of this design thinking, we have to continue to address diversity within our professions. Um, I was here at a time that I think we started to get fairly close to 50-50 on gender. Um, but the profession's still not at that level and in, in leadership level. So I think everybody's sort of taking that upon themselves to, to help that. We have to continue to build on this idea that increasingly data is our relationship with our clients and with our uh, contractors, with our partners. Um, this was a project that we set, it was a campus plan that we did. Um, and we started about a year in advance, set up all kinds of input so people on campus could give us ideas, we could collect data. And then that was real time. So as we would start to test ideas, uh, then we could get responses from people. So they were actually helping shape the plant campus planning process. That became a platform that continues to build the relationship with the client. So now we started by doing a campus master plan. Now they're coming back and we're planning, programming, master planning, and designing buildings, plazas, walkways, all kinds of other things on campus. So again, it's it's by using this idea of data and this interaction in a way that we haven't in the past, it's still kind of changing that idea that you, you need diverse practices and diverse inputs. I mentioned a couple times that we have to start to realize that data is part of what we're providing. Um, so we need to be looking for new forms of revenue, new forms of crea creating and sharing that data. Um, just some examples. There are a number of examples where clients are starting to give us incentives if the building meets an energy target. So you know the next step from that is they're going to hold fees until we prove that it meets those energy targets. It's just one, one way that may go. But firms are also looking at developing tools and software, sensors that help collect da data. Visual Vocal is a, uh, it's basically a PDF for VR that MBBJ, one of our main competitors, developed with Microsoft. Um, so they're trying to standardize so you can quickly shoot a, 
a, a VR video off to your client and they can open it up just like a PDF without anything special. Um, so we have to understand that data is a key part of the services we're providing going forward. To get to some of those new business models, <laughs> we have to rethink ourselves and how we work as businesses. Um, Dave mentioned that we've been going through a process over the last three years where we kind of blew up the old idea of a CEO, a COO, and you know, the big org chart. Um, we, we've kind of blown that up. There are three of us, each with clear areas of responsibility that we think are key parts of the future. So my job is literally to sit around and think about the stuff I'm showing you today. Um, nobody out, most firms don't, aren't organized in a way where somebody at the top is, is thinking about those types of things. On the other side is, a, is another managing partner looking at the intersections of our markets. The, the old way of thinking about it is, we want to do more in healthcare. Uh, how do we get more work in healthcare? Well, now you can't win healthcare unless you know hospitality and residential and, you know, and all the technology. So we've actually reorganized more around this idea of networks. It's a little bit uh, based on the DARPA model where you organize people around an idea and try to come to a, so a solution. Um, integrated project delivery, uh, I think, is a key to the future. Um, it's still a long way from happening, but on the CPMC hospital that we've been working on for about 12 years now, um, mostly because it's very difficult to work in San Francisco, um, integrated project delivery is my solution to design build. Us, the owner, and the contractor share one contract. We share one pool of, of contingency that any mistakes or coordination gets paid out of whatever's left, we get to share it at the end. So what it does is it creates shared values and shared goals, unlike all of those other models where somebody is working for somebody else or two of us are working with the owner and, and pointing fingers at each other. Um, this type of process wasn't possible before Revit. So when this project started, it was the second largest Revit project in the country behind the Freedom Tower. So this just gives you an idea again of the tools and the technologies are changing our relationships as much as how we do our work and that that's key uh, in setting up for the future. This space is Autodesk space in Boston. And I mentioned before that they're focusing a lot on construction. Uh, they're really trying to understand how you get from a, a, a digital file and design to anything physical. Um, I think we need to be pushing just as hard on this and certainly harder than contractors because I could create a scenario where contractors are the ones who are obsolete, not us. Um, with the technology we already have, we can, we can hit print and things can go out, get made, get printed, get assembled, put on an automated truck, driven without a driver, picked up by a crane, put in place. Um, you know, that's not going to happen next week, but there's nothing in that scenario that couldn't happen now. But I think this uh, really gets to the heart of the value we add in terms of design and maybe we need to get get over these old liability insurance models and try to figure out a way instead to own all of the process again. These are just examples again of, of how we could do that from fully printed buildings to different types of assembly. And then the last uh, piece is this what I'm calling the end of style. Um, you know, when, I, I don't think this is a, a, an issue that is so much uh, central to, to school today for most of you. Um, but this idea of we're, we're all participating and driving this big agenda that's about the history of architecture, that's about style, um, is a little bit too bound up in that idea of the architect is the visionary soul creator sitting in the corner and spitting out the Tribune Tower, right? Um, I think there are new values that are starting to come into play. Uh, that old model um, certainly isn't conducive to diversity of any sort. Um, it, it is very much a, about a, an author uh, and a controller of the whole process, and I don't think that's where the world's going. I don't think that's even the way most of the people who are still in this room going to school expect to work. Um, but I think there are values that need to be more integral. Um, the whole idea of social equity and sustainability are kind of the values at play uh, in all design right now. Those come very much out of the integrated design approach. They're very much based on diversity. And I think it's time that we stop having separate uh, design awards for sustainability and quote regular design. You know, AIA's talked about this, so I'll put in a plug for Deb. Um, there has been a lot of discussion that 
that we need to make the steps to sort of make these values foundational to good design and not separate. So, you know, my friend Lance even had to write a book to try to say, look, good design and sustainability are compatible. They're not against one another. So we need to just continue to drive that. And then for you guys, uh, the job market is great for you. <laughs> As of a month ago, these were the openings advertised on a lot of our competitors' pages. You know, so we were at 70, SOM was 90, Canon was 80, Perkins and Will was 98, Stantec 600, HDR 700, go figure. Um, at the end of 2009, early 2010, the unemployment rate for registered architects was 52%. 27.9% of them didn't come back in the profession. So that's more than a generation. That was also the time that there were articles on the cover of the New York Times saying don't go into design, right? So it's even worse than the numbers that, that showed up. So the future is bright for you guys. Um, I think you're bringing values to the whole design process and workplace that are much more collaborative, much more inclusive than you know, my generation and the people sort of running these firms. So I think that's a benefit. The only other thing is Google is now recruiting at Harvard, Cal Poly, RISD, all kinds of other places, and they're not the only one. Um, so on the one hand, the more people we can have out there as clients and community leaders and business leaders who have our background and appreciate the power of design, the better, uh, but that's just making my job that much harder because uh, we're probably not as much fun to work that as Google. <laughs> um, but I think it also, though, reinforces this idea that it, it is about a different kind of design, too, because they're hiring people from design backgrounds to work with the data scientists and help understand how data and all this knowledge comes together in a way that, that, that there's a much different interface than you would get from simply having computer folks do it. So with that, um, I think the idea was to lay out some ideas that will be themes uh, for the, the coming year, um, but I think now we're going to have a panel come up and they haven't seen this, so we'll, I'm anxious to hear what they have to say, too. So thank you. We could have our panel come up, and I'll introduce you. So we're going to have um, four panelists. Uh, I'll tell you about their background in a moment. And uh, they will basically respond from their different perspectives. It's a pretty diverse group. And then we'll have time for a couple of uh, questions and answers, and then we will adjourn to the gallery where there will be a reception. You'll get a chance to talk to Troy and hang out and eat cookies and punch and all that, look at the exhibit. So let me tell you who is here. We're very pleased to have you all here. So immediately on my right is Deb Kuntz. Uh, she is CEO of Core Planning Strategies based in Indianapolis. She's a capital law degree in architecture. She's uh, president of our newly created executive advisory board for CAP, and uh, she's a fellow of uh, AIA. And she's also been a national vice president at AIA, has numerous other recognitions and awards. What's, what's particularly pertinent is her company, Core Planning Strategies, is carving out new ground in how designers can become strategists to help clients move through the building process. So essentially, she steps in and becomes that translator, that person who, at the beginning of a client thinking about doing something, is the advisor and the guide, and then continues on through the process. So they aren't actually generating the design. They're, they literally are guiding the entire process. She's an innovator. She understands the challenges of integrating design, construction, and client expectations. So we're really anxious to hear her thoughts. Next to her is Larry Rohn. Larry is also an alum of CAP with a degree in landscape architecture. Larry has a very unique career. Uh, he served as a VP in both the construction industry with Wilhelm Construction and in the multidisciplinary design firm Browning Day, Mullins Deardorff. He has a perspective of that's uh, really valuable as we examine this intersection and the challenges that Troy just talked about. And I think one of Larry's best decisions was as a high school senior when he chose not to pursue a college football scholarship and came to CAP instead. <laughs> Next to him is Josh Kagashol, who is a Department of Architecture faculty here at CAP. Josh was in practicing architecture for 
25 years uh, in Texas, California, and Indiana. He's been, uh, been a partner and collaborator in the firm Shimizu and Kagashal Architects for over a decade. And he's been directly involved in over 15 national award-winning projects. And his firm is committed to progressive, innovative, and sustainable design that gets translated into built form. And next we have Riley Sandell. Uh, Riley is a senior undergraduate here, majoring in architecture while working on two minors, historic preservation and urban planning. He's secretary for AIAS. He's a member of Freedom by Design. And after graduating, he intends to, uh, to attend graduate school with a focus on community participation and development. He's particularly interested in urban environments and the realities and stories within them with a focus on advancing equity in whatever he undertakes. So um, with that, I'm gonna ask each of them to just give us their reactions and uh, or, or kind of other stimulating thoughts. And uh, if we get into some debate, more the merrier, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Well, first, in, in full disclosure, I first met <laughs> Troy when I was a freshman here. I was uh, top floor, right, in the big studio, and uh, he was in his master's program, right, hanging out in the big studio with like two people. We were all crammed in together. So, and then it turns around, years later, we worked together at Schmidt Associates, so, and now we're friends, so we've known each other for a long time. But, you know, what I love, uh, Troy has always been a thinker, and what I loved about his presentation is that a lot of it I got, a lot of it I uh, understood, I buy into, and yet I learned new things today. So thank you, Troy. So many things that I didn't know. Um, what's really interesting, I think, about what he presented today is if, if you recall his, the calendar when he showed what happened in the, fit, how we started from a master builder and then we were the designer and the builder, and then we got to the 1990s and there was a C, project manager CM, that's my company, <laughs> right? So architects have actually paved the way for me to start a, a niche industry, which is to help be the interpreter of your lingo, of your drawings, and of your processes, because uh, the uh, AI did a study when I was a vice president there, and it, it demonstrated that only one of 10 people have ever interacted with an architect. And do you know where most of their opinions of architects in the design profession comes from? Where do you think it is? Where do you think they get their, if they don't interact with you personally, where do they get their impressions of you? Who said it, movies, TV? Movies and television, that's right. So they think you live in a glass house, overlooking the water, on the mountain, right? And you don't talk to anybody. And sometimes that's true, right? So I think one of the things that we could learn from that is a good takeaway from what Troy talked about today is what do you do when all of this is happening in and around you? You can stay within this building and focus only on what the design profession is doing or I would challenge you to get out of this building and to talk with and communicate with and get integrated with what's happening in the world outside of this building. Because that is where decisions are made every single day. And if you're not there, what do they say? If you're not um, on the menu, if you're not there, you're on the menu and you're gonna get eaten, that's what's gonna happen. So I think that's one of the things that is gonna be important about everything that you heard here tonight is that those are things that don't just happen and aren't gonna show up on your doorstep here. You've gotta go out and find them and be part of the solution and show your value because it is the creativity and the problem solving that ultimately sets you apart. It's not just because you know something more than they do, it's that you can put all the pieces together and put the connections that they, others don't always see, and that is the value that you bring to it. Okay, so <laughs> you guys are all gonna be Howard Rourke standing on top of the building with the wind. You know. Okay, uh, one thing Dave mentioned in my background that is useful for you to know, I was also a client for a while buying design and construction, so I, I, that, that sort of contributes to my worldview. Uh, about getting outside the building, we now have inside the building, at least organizationally, construction management, interior design. Are there any construction management or interior design people here? No, so Dean and Associate, oh, back there. okay, good. <laughs> dean and Associate Dean, we need to make sure that we've got their classes scheduled in a way that doesn't keep them from being a part of this because uh, What's been talked about here, and in my life professional experience, is 
whether it's IPD or, or not, some other contractual structure, the best and most successful experiences for the designers, for the builders, and most importantly for the client is when there is empathy, a word Troy used, empathy and understanding among, and appreciation, among the, the disciplines for where's the money, what, what is everybody's interest, where's the time, and, and so we've got a great opportunity here at CAP now with some new disciplines being organizationally housed here, and we've had a little success, and thank you those of you who have worked on it, where there have been interdisciplinary projects and immersive learning projects that have those disciplines involved. So let's try to learn about that now while you're, you're young, and you're going to be equipped with skill, understanding, and knowledge that will differentiate you when you go out into the marketplace with hundreds of jobs or thousands, uh, which wasn't necessarily the case in the mid-70s, a day. Uh, so let's see, do I have anything else I want to just add up? Uh, no, not for now. Oh, okay, thanks for coming. Um, I am surprised uh, on a lot of the imagery you showed that um, a lot of that um, cutting edge stuff was actually developed in the academies, not in the professional environment. Um, from the Gramazio Kohler who spoke here last year, um, uh, to the ideas of computation and parametrics, um, the, the redevelopment and the change of the firm, of the profession has come directly out of the academies in the last 20 years in the digital project. So it's, it's, it's uh, uh, to me it shows the value of what places like this do uh, around the country. Um, it's interesting, you talked a little bit about it as a, or a lot of it as a sort of a technological project um, that, that we're engaged in, and I still think the value that we bring is more of a cultural product. Um, that, that, uh, so those would be the two things that, that just right off the bat, that um, is, is it, uh, will technology solve our problems? Um, and uh, you know, how much the value of the academy brings to it. So. Um, something that I found interesting that you talked about was the fact that we are all sitting here learning what creativity is when other people are out there sort of missing that. And I think that sort of through your PowerPoint, you ended up in the fact that we're going to be designers. You also had that graphic that Deb brought up that centuries ago we were designers and builders and mathematicians and we just did everything and then there were basically slaves that made our buildings. And in the design build model, now we are an expert in design thinking. And then there's 40 other people that are experts in the other parts of building that are necessary. So at some point there will be somebody with an expertise in everything, so then the value we place on design thinking in our education becomes more paramount. Because as you can see, we no longer necessarily know how to make structural analysis for a skyscraper. We can probably do it for a two-story building. But they used to have to know that. But our necessity to do those types of things outside of design thinking are dwindling as people are becoming experts in those specific types of tasks. So it becomes important when you're learning through all these things to understand to be able to communicate while in that design build integrated model, but to take value in what we have as design thinkers more paramount than what we can offer in another field that somebody else would have hold of. Um, so when you think about expecting people to come to you so I think in the past we've expected everyone to come to us because we're the architect or the landscape architect because people value design inherently. I don't think that's the case. I think they appreciate it. Think about how many carry an iPhone, right? There's design and people value that in design. But you have to go out and put it in front of them. You've got to be able to have the conversation with them about what it, what it means to them and, and what a difference it's going to make in their life. And let me just pick on prefab for a second. Um, there's a company Ermco Electric in Indianapolis, I went to their factory and they do, they put electrical packages together in a box. They basically send everything for a room in a box to the site and the guy is provided the box and he sticks, puts everything in. They are prefabbing everything. 
before it actually gets to the site. And my question to them was, how are the designers changing how they're putting together their designs so that it ultimately makes it easier for you to prefab? And he said, they're not. So there's an opportunity. Because if you're the one who is going out and making the relationship with the contractor to figure out how you can do it more efficiently, more effectively, then that's going to be another way for you to differentiate. But don't wait for them to come to you. You've got to seek it out. Then you're going to be really valued from that perspective. Well, I think the, I think the cultural comment is important because it, it's easy to sort of point at examples that are technology and are, are concrete. And, and I think the big theme is uh, we sort of have to get out of we've sort of got to break the culture that we're embedded in because that culture is actually what prevents us from seeing how these tools augment us. I mean, I completely agree it's not uh, a determinism in any way, but it's an augmentation. But right now, uh, we're not at a place where I think we're even seeing this as, as being something that is a partner or an augmentation to, to what we do or adding a dimension and value and a skill to what we do. So I think ultimately, it's a cultural problem. Um, and I think that's, that, that attests to the fact of why some of these other trends have happened. And as professions, we've never even seen they were happening until all of a sudden we can put a chart up and say, you know, damn, that happened 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think we have to find a way to drive the culture around these changes, which I think necessitates getting out of the way we think about ourselves in some ways and, what, and how we relate to people. Okay. <clears throat> I mean, I think you were optimistic on the wave of automation coming to architecture. I mean, it, to me, it's anything that's sort of generic and uh, based purely on metrics will be automated. You know, yeah. like if you think of like a Walgreens, if they're not already automated, they're going to be where you input the, the simple metrics you need, it will calculate it being computation, structural analysis, um, the, the documents where there's no value in what we do other than maybe managing the project. That, that where the cultural project is, or the design comes in is where do we bring value into it. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a feeling, my, my gut feeling is a lot of the profession will get wiped out with that. Like the people who do yeah. the sort of bread and butter um, yeah. kind of offices, you know. So it'll be either large, you know, companies like yours or sort of mom and pop shops. Uh, the middle people, I think, are just going to get wiped out yeah. in this, uh, in this the coming decades. So I think that's right. I, I, when, when you think about what can happen to just doing construction documents with all this stuff, I mean, that's 35% of the industry's fees in rough numbers. That's a third of the people. Um, and you're right, and, and until you can serve that other value point farther up, uh, I completely agree because a lot of work is commodity work. Design build contractors who are looking at they're, they're going down and making lists of all the building types that architects don't want to design, you know, data centers, warehouses, you know, <laughs> all this stuff. And they can, they can already do them parametrically. They're just waiting to figure out how to deal with the liability and stamp them and not make us mad in the meantime. So you're completely right. You, you've got to, be dry, you've got to be building practices around these areas of expertise and this added value of it's still about design, right? <laughs> it's also still about smarter design. Um, so I, I completely agree. Well, let's not make this just about buildings, because even yeah. these cookie cutter bread and butter buildings don't necessarily all go on the same kind of site. So those of you who are landscape architects here, there's still some work there. And you all need to become uh, cognizant and aware and empathetic of what everybody else does, too, for all the same reasons. So I just don't want to forget our friends with muddy boots. No, that's all right. <laughs> Any questions from the audience? Yeah. Um, so you mentioned how the AIA is starting to push uh, green and sustainable design as a core fun foundational element of our future professions. How do we instill that in clients instead of saying, you know, the clients who'd say, oh, I want a code minimum, you know, as, mo as little money as I can spend on this product as possible. How do we go about convincing them and shifting their culture to value the sustainable elements that we value? Um, I think compared to where it was even five or ten years ago, um, a lot of where we are is because we had clients who were pushing for it. Early on, there was a lot of grumbling about sustainability is expensive and, you know, is it worth it and all of that. 
Um, but even developers now, we see develop, developers coming to us knowing that they're going to design and build a spec office building, and it needs to have at least a lead silver, you know, just to make it marketable. <laughs> so compared to where it was, I think the clients in general are in a much more positive place in helping drive more of this because the public now wants it. Um, but there, I guess there will probably always be some outliers. Um, who aren't on board, but my sense is it's a much better place than it was several years ago, and a yeah. lot of it was because clients drove yeah, it. Yeah, it's come a long way, and LEED has become right a, a, a name that a lot of people can use, the average public can use. I can tell you, I'm, I have, haven't, I'm a LEED accredited professional, but I'm not a LEED fan. But to me, what it's done is it's created a, a language, a lingo that the average person can say, can utilize. But what's happening is if you talk to the code officials, maybe not here in Indiana because it takes us 10 years to catch up, but those who are leading the charge in states who are leading the charge on code are changing their codes to be, because I said to lead, you're going to be obsolete. The codes are going to adopt where you are, and they said we'll always stay ahead of the code. So the codes are going to follow what lead is what lead's doing, and that's why I think what you're going to see change. In Washington, D.C., you, you can't do a project that's not at least silver now. Um, we have a lot of campus, we do a lot of campus planning, you'll see some of them out here. We have a lot of campuses who are now asking how can we be a, a net zero campus. Forget the building, how in aggregate can we be a net zero campus? Or a net uh, no growth campus. We've even had a campus come to us and say we want to we want to grow the campus and everything but we don't want to add any square footage so how do we reuse space? So it is being institutionalized um, and, and, and LEED is a little bit passe. <laughs> Um, you know, the, the federal government, a number of agencies in federal government say, we want to use the LEED checklist, but we're not going to pay the fees and go through the LEED. Um, but now with Living Building Challenge and, and all kinds of other things, uh, the one, the Brock Center, uh, we got approval, we drink rainwater. It's a net zero water and a net zero energy building. So the more and more of those types of things get out there, I think uh, it just snowballs. Other questions? I think I can phrase this in a question and, and sort of start out with older people in the room will remember when design build was either unethical or forbidden in some professions. Are, are we saying, because it was a conflict of interest, we're here to represent our client's best interest, are you recommending what's good for the client or what, what we can build for you was the basis of the, of the concern. Is that over? We can now build anything so it's okay for um, the two to be combined? I, I don't think the design profession is, is pushing design build anywhere, but uh, half of our work in Los Angeles and 40% of our work in San Francisco is design build driven by the clients. So it is, there are still variations that, are, that tend to be regional. Um, you know, some states, I think Indiana, Larry and I were talking, in Indiana, you still have to do bridging documents and then have a separate design build team, which I think is the old idea of at least having some of that check and balance maybe. But all, our work in California, forget it, out of the box, it's design build. Um, and the bigger threat to firms is we used to spend $20,000, $25,000 winning a, winning a project you know, with proposals and interviews. Design build will drop a quarter of a million to $400,000 doing all the schematic design and DD before we even know if we won the job. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's completely disappeared in some places where we are being led by the contractors directly to the owners. Other questions? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and I'll, I'll tie it in a little bit to what the design build question that Malcolm asked, which is, uh, you know, in some ways, design build is here because we've let, allowed yeah. someone else to be the stronger voice to our clients. And the reason that all of California does it that way is because they're, they're seeing success in it and or people are saying it's a really good thing. So it's in some ways about marketing. It's, that's how it starts. But we have allowed that to be eroded away. So I, I think, A, when you leave this building, whatever uh, profession you're in, you're going to be working as a team. 
And the integrated design model of having everybody at the table and being part of it is absolutely the way to be. So the, the more you get on board early and can understand and respect what the other brings to it, that's the key. That's the key. Well, I'm, as I said earlier, personally very excited about the idea of the possibility of the cross-fertilization. So I don't know what the answer is for how that's going to happen. People in the academy are going to help figure that out. and <laughs> Some of us on the outside will have an opinion and suggestions. The comment about design build and uh, the letting, le the design disciplines letting that erode isn't exactly right. Um, the reality is where the most digits are in the contract <laughs> is where the responsibility goes and that's why the construction companies are the generally contractual leaders in that. That's not to say there's not great opportunity for wonderful collaboration and respect and knowledge and we'll sing kumbaya later, but uh, it, it could really uh, still be possible and should be possible for the designers to have uh, leadership and ownership of the process. Well, and the clients want it. They want single point responsibility. I can, when we represent clients, that's what they want. I can't blame them. I mean, it, it, it seems to me the, the together part, the construction management with it, it gets rid of, um, your word was adversarial um, relationship with your contractor, where the contractor's looking for mistakes uh, in order to change order to make money. Um, they don't really care about the aesthetics or, or the things that the architects care about. Um, and the architects don't know how to do some of the things. So instead of uh, having a kind of confrontational relationship, the design build allows architects to ask questions early uh, and get prices early. So I think it's a, a, a really healthy way of doing business. It just gets rid of the competitive bidding right early on, uh, is my understanding of it. I saw a head shake. Well, it, there's, there's still going to be cost competition. Yeah. Um, but I don't know if that's what my head shake was. Sorry. I, notoriously an eye roller and don't mean to be. <laughs> well, and I think the other thing, it goes back to the culture, though. I think that's the great benefit of, is we're actually going to start to, to have people going out in the world in, in four or five years. You have a completely different understanding of the whole idea of design and construction. I think it really gets to the heart of this cultural divide that all of these models are somehow either trying to respond to or take advantage of or, you know, depending on your perspective. <laughs> So I think it does go back to this idea of the culture thing of when and how design happens and how that gets translated into the world. And you know, I, I was talking to Dave. I don't, I don't think um, you know designers go go out of school you know distrusting and not liking contractors. You learn it after you get out. The same with you know people who go into the construction field. You don't go out thinking designers are are, are stupid. <laughs> but over time, <laughs> the industry changes that. So I'm hoping that by having this common understanding of people interacting throughout all kinds of the different creative processes and, and education that people don't default to that so quickly, maybe. <laughs> Other questions? Scott? Uh, one of the things Dave and I have kind of talked about this earlier today, too. Um, I think it, I, I think, I guess I don't, I don't know what the answer is, but I think what's actually interesting is I think what we've set up this year is we're trying to create a process uh, that links the academy and practice in a way that I, I don't think has happened anywhere else. And maybe out of this, we'll start to, to get some of that. Um, because I, we want, in, in practice, we want the connections to the academy just as much as, as most professions now want connections to the professions, right? So I think more of these types of interaction things may help answer that. I don't, I don't know off the top of my head uh, what some of those solutions might be. I would defer to some of you guys, maybe. I, I don't have the answer, but I, I think there could be some um, 
wisdom in looking around the nation to see where, regu where other models where they're reducing regulations in order to you know, get st and still get results, right? So it's about the results that we want, not about do this, do this, do this. So we have the do this, do this, do this. What we're really after is the result. So I think if there's a way to look at what, how other models, and I think there's some, some in government that are starting to do that, there could be some ideas there. I think what the bodies are doing to shift the ability, at least on the architecture side, to take the exam even when you're in college is a huge shift forward. And even four years ago when I was on the AI board, they acted like it was not even possible. And, and yet they're, I think it's really possible now. So I, some of it's changing, but I think it's going to take a, uh, a disruption of the profession to really cause a significant change. And CLARB actually is interesting. Because I've, I've talked to Joel quite a bit because they're in DC. And CLARB, uh, he made everybody on his board read the future of the professions. <laughs> Um, so CLARB is actually saying, you know, what is the future of professional responsibility in, in this new culture and with all this technology? I, he's, he's trying to start to have a dialogue with uh, NCARB, but I don't, that's not happened yet. I'm waiting for the meeting invite. Um, but but uh, CLARB in particular is actually pretty aggressive and creative about trying to understand what to do. There, there's, in the construction accreditation, there's one of the learning outcomes that is uh, graded and stressed that is interdisciplinary projects and interdisciplinary learning so there may be a bit of a model there that could be adapted or at least an awareness that could be raised up. So. Well, I'm going <clears> to <throat> suggest that if there are more questions that you corral our speaker and or the panel as we're at the reception so thank you and let's thank Troy and our panel one more time.